Who is Beth Guest? few of my colleagues in the house. Um, so I'm going to um, kick things off here this morning. Um, change. Okay, great. Well, um, the St. Paul City Council Budget Committee will come to order. Um, we have a, a, a full agenda here today. We will be getting um, information on parking funds, some follow-up on HRA questions, a report about STAR and CIB. Our presenters will be uh, Director Goodman uh, from PED and also Ms. Earl from our uh, OFS. Um, and we have a, a, a bevy of uh, PED staff available to answer uh, questions. And um, as per usual in the budget committee meetings, we'll just ask questions as we go through. Sometimes follow-up questions, we get more follow-up questions. Um, and so we will we'll just interrupt um, along the way. Um, sometimes I just look for an, a break in your natural presentation um, cadence to, to bust in, but we'll, I'll keep an eye on, on my colleagues and make sure we're um, uh, asking questions along the way. And hopefully by the time we reach the end, we will have um, answered all the questions and and as always, uh, sometimes uh, there are things that pop up after we have these meetings. And of course, we can address those through um, Holly. And if we need you to come back and share more information, we'll invite you back. Um, we still have a few months, uh, well, about a month and a half before we pass our final budget. So we do have some time um, as we work through this. So um, with that information, um, I will do our best to keep us on track and on time. And I will turn things over to Director Goodman. Welcome. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Bryn Moen and council members. I um, I will share my screen this morning. Know that when I share my screen, I can't see see you very well. And also, if you have questions, I may or may not be able to tell that you have them. So just jump in. Um, Ms. Ms. Goodman, I'll go ahead and watch that for you and you just okay. do the presentation. I'll let you know if we have questions. Excellent. Okay. I'm going to share my screen then so that you can and we'll see if you can see it. Can you see my screen? I cannot yet. Okay. Let's see. Share. Share. Okay, hold on. See if I can get there for you. Still no? Not yet. All right. I'm trying to make sure I've got the same, the right presentation coming up for you. Um, something is popping up. This is strange. The Not screen, yet. The, nope. The screen popped up for a minute, and then it said there was a there was an error or a problem. Okay. Hang on. I'm sorry. That's all right. It says can't see the screen. All right. I'll try something else. Give it one more try, and then I do. If we have the presentation, um, Holly can run it for us. Um, we can try another option. Oh, Oop. looks like now we've got it. I think it's coming. Yep, we got it. Okay. All right. There. Can you see that? Excellent. Yep. Okay. All right. I'm here this morning um, with a follow-up to the HRA and PED budget presentation that I gave on September 23rd. So you have a packet. You've received a packet of materials with more information about everything I will be covering this morning. Um, I'll be covering a couple of different topics today. Regarding um, the parking fund, there there just wasn't a lot of information for you um, in the last presentation, and, and I will have a slide. I will have further slides on all of these just to cover what will just to let you know what I'll be covering is the parking fund information, and then 
um, questions you had had regarding um, HRA funds, the requirement and policy for reserves or fund balances on those, more, de more detail on transfers for other uses, um, the program funding proposals with more specificity on the program proposals and um, current program balances and estimated carryover, particularly on full staff. And then department operations, there was a question about status of data management system and the uh, business process documentation and then follow up on the staff vacancies. We'll start with the parking. Um, again, a parking update was not included in the, in the previous budget presentation. This slide is an overview of the parking system, which you probably primarily know by heart. Um, there are nine ramps five surface lots, which is a little over 7,000 7, spaces. That's 30% of all of the downtown off-street parking spaces are in our system. This does not include the River Center ramp. In April, in April, 91% of ramp capacity was occupied with contracts. Currently, we're at 53% of capacity, and that is contracts. That is not how many people are parking in the parking system. Um, right now, usage is is you know 10 to 20 percent so if you go down and you get into a parking ramp you'll see that it is largely empty um so so there are contracts that are still being paid at the level of about 53 percent of capacity but we do expect that um that we may have some other cancellations or some other um other contracts that are that are reduced um excuse me Excuse me. Oper so um, HRA again owns these facilities. It's a it's a hundred million dollars worth of assets, and the, there are operating agreements with five different parking management companies. And the operators run the parking facilities, and they use the revenues for the ongoing operations costs. So, do you have any questions about this map? I think again, that's probably something you're all very familiar with. All right, so just to reiterate, parking revenues have been significantly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic due to losses in parking and in, in event parking and office worker contracts. Um, fortunately, the quarter one was really very strong um, and revenues were, were above budget. So that's helpful. Um, again, we're hearing from some contract holders that their employees maybe won't be back to the office until June. So this is, you know, not what we originally hoped, but this is the, the way it is right now. We do have sufficient reserves for debt service, repairs, and operations for 2020 and, for tw and, and in the 2021 proposal. The next slide um, provides more detail on the reserves and other measures to maintain that sort of stability in the system in this unstable time. Um, the World Trade Center, just as a note, the World Trade Center ramp was removed from the parking fund in 2020 for better tracking and reporting on the funds that were pledged from that ramp to the Housing Trust Fund. So in your packet, there are additional, there's additional information on the World Trade Center parking fund. All right, with many unknowns about revenue in the near term, we've taken several measures to maintain the parking system stability. Um, those, in, those include um, ensuring ample reserves, debt service reserves are required, repair and replacement reserves are required for parking facilities financed with bonds. The repair um, and replacement reserve for the entire system is based on an average of capital repair costs for the previous, the prior five years. While not required, an operating reserve is prudent and, and has shown to be necessary to cover costs if revenues decline below the cost to operate. So the proposed operating reserve in 2021 is 1.6 million, which is just under half of the amount of the 2019 system operating costs. So um, prudent planning has, has, has proven to be um, necessary and, and we're thankful for that. So we intend to maintain the quality of the facilities and operations make strategic capital improvements and defer some large capital projects to 2022. We have implemented and the, and the parking operators have implemented cost saving measures within the operations of the ramps. 
We do have a lesser demand for some uses of funds not connected to maintaining the HRA parking system. And finally, retaining $1.5 million in revenue from the 2019 sale of the spruce tree ramp for operating reserve, again, was a, a measure that was taken and absolutely turned out to be necessary. So we're thankful for that earlier decision. And Ms. Goodman, I, I appreciate your pointing that out. A lot of times when we walk through um, the parking fund, we question the the um, rich reserve funds that we have and kind of like, how could we ever possibly need this much reserves? And so I think just hearkening back to that, uh, those questions and recognizing that those decisions actually have definitely saved us this year, um, that's really helpful. And, you know, whether or not, um, you know, any a situation like this could have ever unfolded, it's hard to say, but I do appreciate the fact that um, there's a, a line back to those decisions that were made. Um, and again, at the time was like, geez, this seems like a lot of money to have in reserves. Agreed, agreed. Now, it, I'm sure it seemed conservative and, you know, who would imagine that this this situation would happen in our lifetimes? I, I still can't believe it. I still can't believe that I took a new job and haven't met any of you. This is all just such a strange, a strange world we're living in right now, but it really is impacting parking revenue. So it's, it's very, very fortunate that you were this conservative. I wasn't here, obviously, for the, these are previous year's decisions, but um, it's important and impressive that you planned ahead. I know when I watched the previous year's budget presentations, uh, someone had asked for a bar chart. Where's the bar chart? And this is the bar chart. Um, I know it's hard to see on the screen. I hope that you have it in your packet and can see it. Um, so this is one you've seen in, in previous years. It's a little bit a little bit hard to see. I I can I will walk through the the different categories just a little bit. I'll focus on the first two, and I'm going to go from the colors at the top to the colors at the bottom. Um, I don't know that you want me to walk through all of them. You can kind of see that most of them haven't changed much, but the, the brown and the gray are what have changed a bit. Um, the brown is the unrestricted cash at the top. That is an unbudgeted, unreserved fund balance. And the reason why it's so much higher in 2019 and 2020 is due to sales of actual parking system properties. So those, those are unusually high numbers, but that, that was the reason why. Most of those revenues have been budgeted for spending, but the the influx is why you see those larger um, color blocks of that color. The next one down is the gray, which is reserved for future year commitments. Again, reserve and uh, transfers. Funds that have been committed for future year uses are held in reserve in the parking fund. This again is not a, a formal requirement, but necessary to ensure that commitments can be met. Some examples of the 20 uh, include 2021 transfers from the parking fund. Uh, committed in the 2020 budget for city building maintenance, um, library materials, the executive project lead position in the mayor's office, and a contract for the Rice Larpenter revitalization planning. So uh, those are the two that are primarily, uh, you know, a little bit different or that fluctuate. Do you want me to walk through all the others or would you prefer I move on? Um, I'm going to look to my colleagues. I see Ms. Naker has a hand up. Thanks, Council President. Just a clarifying question, Director Goodman. So yep. although that dark gray is reserved for future projects, mm -hmm. um, is it is it accurate to say that those dollars are also unrestricted dollars that we have previously decided to spend on those projects, but they're both the and whatever the brown and the gray are kind of cash and the gray just shows what we've already decided to spend on something specific? Yes, that's what we've committed to future year uses. Yes. Okay, yep. thanks. And then I, I have a, a separate question just about the actual budget document that you provided, which isn't part of this presentation. Right. Um, and I don't know if that if that can be pulled up or not, but it, it seems like there are um, there's dramatic differences in what we're budgeting for 2021 compared to 2020 um, mm -hmm. and also big differences in what we were projecting in 2020 compared to what we adopted, like, for example, the Ford planning manager, that position doubled in cost right. between what we adopted and proposed. Um, building maintenance and library collections doubled in cost in 2020. Um, you know, can you talk I about have, why there's such a dramatic yes, difference in what yes. we... Yes, I had the exact same questions. Okay. Um, and the, it's, it's budgeted for, it was budgeted ahead for three years out of the sale of the gateway site. So you're seeing two years worth in one of those years on all of those things, two years of, of reserve. So the expense wasn't higher, 
the the reserve was there's two years worth of reserve in those years that you in the year that you see that it's double. I have the very same question. Um, so same with library co collections and building maintenance. It's um, a multi-year commitment for for the future use. Does that make sense? Uh, I, that's what I said. Why are these numbers double in the one year? But it's um, it, that's the reason why. And and apologies. Know that like um, I'm catching up as you are because I I got here after the budget was largely already um, completed. So these are questions I've had as well. But excellent question. <laughs> Can I just have one follow up, Council President, mm -hmm. on that? Um, so similarly for the River Center Reserve for the ramp, mm -hmm. um, looks like we've we budgeted. 3.4 million in 2020. We're budgeting 2.1 million in 2021. Um, I assume that whatever we budget, if that's not spent, it goes back into cash. And can you confirm that? And then is it um, is there certain a certain amount that we try to budget year over year, or are there specific expenses of the ramp that we're trying to cover? Because 2.1 obviously is a lot smaller than 3.4. Unless, yeah, I think and and. Uh, Deputy Director um, Guild may have a, additional information, but again, these are reserves that we make a decision to set aside a certain amount. And and in this this year coming up, um, we have other things we needed to to direct those funds towards for that reserve. So this is what we have left to, to kind of keep there. Uh, Kristen, do you have anything additional to add to that? Um, yes, thank you, Director Goodman and uh, Council President and Council Member Naker. Um, that that specific reserve is actually for um, uh, needs that we're expecting for the ramp replacement. It's not for ramp operations or ramp capital. Um, so just to clarify that point, um, as we had excess revenues in the parking parking system over the past few years, um, because we had really really good revenues for the past you know number of years, we were building up a reserve anticipating that there would be some significant costs connected to replacing the river center ramp. Um, so we had built up that reserve to 3.4 million um, and we're just holding those dollars. Um, we can't maintain, we don't recommend maintaining that level of reserve in 2021 um, because we think that we might need those those dollars for, for other purposes, including making sure that we have adequate operating reserves. So that's why we're proposing a lesser amount in 2021 than we had built up in 2020. So that's helpful to be clear then. There's no commitment to the River Center, the convention, the visitor's authority, anything like that for a certain amount year over year. It's just what we have around to be prudent. Yep, it's literally this this being trying to be conservative, trying to plan ahead. Um, uh, uh, there there are a lot of things that are put in reserve, but it's just it, it's that sort of that planning ahead. Um, also, though, as you mentioned, with flexibility, as needs <laughs> rise or as um, pandemics hit, <laughs> and, and and priorities have to change. So so. Um, Again, do you, would you like for me to walk through each of these? There, uh, each of these categories, or are those two the two you have the most interest in? The others are kind of what you've seen every year. Um, I think, I think that the the two categories are probably the or the, that you've covered are probably the key ones. I'm I'm just looking to see if my colleagues have any um, of the other bar sections that they'd like to hear more about. about but as I think, as you pointed out, the two. Um, top are the ones that have changed the most in the past few years or rest um, are part of yes. that kind of stack of reserves. I'm looking and I do not see um, further questions on the slide. Okay. So the takeaway in the parking fund is that revenues are way down. We're okay because we had sufficient reserves and we're trying to be realistic with our expectations for net operating income for this year, um, given that, you know, we, it's this has gone on longer than we expected with COVID, and and we continue to learn that um, that we may have either people not coming back or not keeping their contracts or coming back later or uh, contracting for less. So we'll just have to keep monitoring that. All right, I am going to move on to the next piece of the presentation. If we're done with parking, sounds good. All right. So these are questions and follow-up items from the earlier budget presentation. In your packet, there's a written document that goes into detail about each of these things. And I will also have some slides coming up after this one that, that cover these things. So the HRA funds, again, um, talked a little bit about what you want to see um, 
were there requirements for reserves and fund balances, what more about the program funding proposals, and more about the operations. So I'll move to the next few slides. Um, question about whether or whether there are restrictions on uses or reserves of the fund balances, and that that varies by fund type. I covered a lot of this in the previous presentation. The various different fund uh, types and what's uh, flexible. There are details on the funds and the restrictions in your in your document, but some highlights um, are, as I mentioned before in the previous presentation, the general fund and the loan enterprise fund are the only two that are unrestricted. So those are the two that you're, that you're used to seeing through the years. While there is not a formal policy, we do retain a 15% operating reserve for the HRA general fund and loan enterprise fund, um, including the HRA portion of the PED operations budget. And the parking fund includes a number of reserves, as we just mentioned, both required by lenders and best practices, including reserves to cover debt service, repairs, and operations. Thank goodness for reserves this year. Um, there had been uh, a slide, this slide is a follow-up providing detail on what is paid for with funds transferred out of the HRA budget. Um, we did kind of go over this in the previous presentation. So you'll see there are staff positions for um, city council, HERO, um, the board of commissioners staff, some of the mayor's office, the Office of Financial Empowerment. Um, so these are all, the, a lot of these are staff positions that, that do intersect with HRA and PED. And then um, for non-HRA uses, there is, um, there's a breakdown in your packet of this of this two million seven hundred eight thousand um, dollars. So if you and, and I don't know if there's a slide on that, but if there's not and you have questions, we will go back to that. Okay, this slide and the next slide uh, provide more detail on the budgets for proposed programs. And we did go through these programs in the previous presentation, but we'll talk about them a little bit more. They're all um, programs that we're finalizing on um, development of. Some of them we've finalized details on. All of the program proposal budget requests are capital investment dollars or consulting contracts, mostly for capital investments. Only the housing trust fund budget proposal includes some dollars for staffing. Uh, the Fair Housing Coordinator position in OFE and the Housing Policy Project Man Manager position in PED. So we'll go a little deeper into that here. So all of this you kind of saw at the previous presentation, it may be in a little bit different format, just so you can see. And what you're seeing is the first column is the 2020 carry forward, what we think we'll have you know, left. Um, the the second column is what we intend to add for this year, and the third column is the total for 21, including those together. I have slides coming up about full stack, which is the top number, so we'll, I'll go deeper into that. Um, the others, again, you've seen before, the business assistance includes the um, our existing business support programs and then the program for uh, businesses impacted by civil unrest, which I will be bringing um, some guidelines to the next um, HRA meeting about that as an update, not final guidelines, but an update. So you'll see where we are on that. Uh, Pre-development costs, which are, you know, for any um, HRA project, there may be consultants or market studies or various things that, that um, happen each year. We have a little bit that we're carrying over. Um, and then or quite a bit that we're carrying over and a little bit more that we'll add this year. Strategic Investment Fund is, you know, a business attraction, attraction fund. And then the, the data management, um, we've spent everything that we don't have a carryover, but we're looking for another 200,000. And I also will be going deeper into that program on another slide. All right, there's a few slides on full stack. Before, before you move into that, um, Ms. Goodman, yes. it looks like Ms. Ninker has a question. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Council President. Um, Director Goodman, the Job Opportunity Fund, it shows $0 being proposed, $0 carryover. Um, the HRA funding one sheet that you provided us showed $50,000 in carryover. So I, I guess I have two questions. One is, yep. is it 50,000 or is it zero? And then if it's zero, does that mean we're, we are no longer, we don't have a Job Opportunity Fund anymore? We're ending I think the program? we just used the last of it um, on, an, on an allocation for uh, high high, I think it was in the last, um, HRA board meeting, 
Kristen, is that, can you confirm that for me? Director Goodman, yes, that's correct. Okay. So zeroing it out, does that mean that we-, we Zeroing not, it out. Zeroing it out, as far as I can- More job opportunity fund. Right, <laughs> apparently no. Is there I a don't. reason for that? I mean, just anything else right. you want to say, but it's a, no, it's a major good program and- Did it, um, it may have had a, a, a sunset, I, I, and apologies that I don't know the answers to that. Um, Deputy Director Gill, can you provide a reason for the, is that just, a, if we come to the end of that program? It, if you don't, if you don't mind, um, Ms. Goodman and um, Ms. Naker and Ms. Gill, could we, could Ms. Naker finish her question? Oh, I'm and sorry. Just, uh, I just would like to make sure that we get the, the full question um, so that we can follow up. Um, we're taking notes. And so if you wouldn't mind, just let, let's get the whole question before we answer it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, Council President. I, I think I had mostly finished, but just just going to say that it's a it's a major fund. We've talked about it a lot here at the table, and it's um, my understanding is it is an ongoing program. So seeing it zeroed out uh, with no more information was a little bit surprising. So would love more context. Thank you, thank you, Councilmember. And Ms. Geld. Uh, yes, Kristen Gilt here, uh, Council President uh, Bren Moen and Council Member Naker. Um, the Job Opportunity Fund, when we established it, was capitalized with a, a fairly significant chunk of money um, uh, from actually a sale of, of HRA property. Um, and it was capitalized anticipating that that, that, that um, full amount would carry us over several years. So it wasn't ever set up as an annual allocation. Um, and we've just been kind of keeping track of, um, you know, what our expected draw on, the, on that fund would be. Um, our draw on that fund in, in uh, 2019, 2020 was, was actually fairly slow. So as we were putting together the, the budget proposal, we didn't necessarily anticipate that this would, would in fact be zero going into 2021. Um, I think one thing that we've done um, when we've had applications for the Job Opportunity Fund um, that maybe didn't fit the program guidelines exactly is we've looked to some other um, less stringent programs that are within HRA, such as the Business Assistance Program, um, and crafted a, a unique uh, le loan agreement uh, you know, based on the guidelines of Job Opportunity Fund, but using dollars that were actually budgeted to another to another program. So I wouldn't anticipate that we would be communicating, you know, full stop on Job Opportunity Fund, um, but we might we might be coming to the HRA with some pro some proposals to use other sources in a way similar to the Job Opportunity Fund. I I appreciate that, and um, just to be clear as a concluding statement here, I, I think it's great to be taking a critical look at each of our business funds and specifically looking at how quickly and how easy, how quickly they're drawn down and how easy they are to access and, and reassessing our criteria as a result. And I actually like the idea of consolidating more into one fund and just kind of divvying it out based on what the needs are and, and the criteria, having one set of criteria rather than eight different funds. I noticed though that we're creating two new funds this year. Um, I, I think both uh, BIPOC business assistance funds that I think the details are still being worked out for, but I just hope we're, we're kind of keeping the lessons of like job opportunity fund in mind as we potentially spin off new funding streams. Yes, thank you council member. Those are, those are really important thoughts. I, I, I do hear what you're saying, and um, I think sometimes we're, we're reacting to situations and, and um, the environment, but yes, absolutely, I, I hear what you're saying. And apologies for my interruption. I'm, I'm struggling with seeing you faces and hands in my screen and I, at the same time, so apologies. And Ms. Goodman, that's, and no no worries. I just want to make sure that we're keeping track of what the questions are um, on our side. So um, no harm, no foul. I'm um, I, I just seconding uh, at a bit what Ms. Naker is saying. Um, I just think from even from a marketing and branding perspective, it's hard to communicate where our, what our resources are if the name changes every year. So um, even on just a very basic level, um, you know, adjusting our programs to meet the need as opposed to adjusting the names and starting a new fund is probably um, a, a good move. I've, I've a few times, and I know this is coming up ahead of us, but a few times have um, 
pointed out that we advertise like star funds or CIB funds and nobody knows what a star fund is. And so, you know, working on communicating clearly um, with the name of a, of, of a particular fund and also being consistent and in, in having that resource available, I think helps people get more familiar with it and, and will increase the um, amount of applicants. I know in um, lots of communities, somebody has to try it first and then come back and tell their friends this worked and then their friends try it and pretty soon it goes, but it takes, you know, several years to sometimes to, for these um, programs to get established. So I, I um, kind of seconding and a little bit on a tangent of what Ms. Naker said as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Brimon. Those are, those are excellent points. I will say that um, clearly articulating our programs and maybe looking at names um, and, for, and maybe even something like full stack, which we'll talk about next, like it's, you know, how descriptive are our program names and um, and that guidelines? Um, there's it's it's confusing to me, and I've been I've been here just a couple of months, and, but I'm still trying to determine all those details. And I think we could do a better job. Uh, my my first reaction is we could probably do a better job of communicating all of those things. So thank you for those that input. Um, all right, so I'm going to move to full stack. I want to say about full stack. Um, before I even applied for this job while I was in Oklahoma City, this full stack sort of innovation fund was something I was watching from Oklahoma City. I had come across it as we were working on an Oklahoma City innovation district. And um, I think this program is, is one that really can make an impact on our economic recovery from COVID. Um, I, many people will need to be reskilled and many companies will need to innovate in order to survive um, this pandemic. And so I think that's a lot of what full stack is for. So that was off script, but just a little um, little bit of backstory from me on full stack. I think it's important. So there's a few slides here on full stack. Um, since 2018, there's been an annual um, a budget of 300,000 for programmatic investments, including scholarships for tech training, for help desk and programming certificates, now with contributions from the Ramsey County Workforce Solutions. Marketing and events, reinforcing St. Paul is a place for innovation focused business growth. Um, there was an additional 150,000 budgeted in 2020 for investments in business recruitment and growth, including, including incubator models such as Techstars. Some highlights um, on the program. Tech training programs have pivoted to remote learning and remain very competitive options for pandemic secure careers. We funded eight full scholarships to software development and user experience design with 11 strong candidates for, the 20, for 2020, including a right track cohort. Community engagement and training events such as Hack the Gap and Twin City Startup Week continued in a modified mix of smaller in-person and virtual events. Um, we sponsored dozens of virtual labs and hackathons, including Lunar Labs, Coven, and even Startup Week at Keg and Case. And launched a res restaurant resiliency project to focus on new tech for brick and mortar, also engaging right track youth interested in tech and marketing. So there were 16 restaurant consultations and five digital implementations of uh, that program, which is um, really important. This is a really, this is timely and really important program. So. That was a good move. Finally, of course, there have been challenges. Um, COVID and civil unrest greatly impacted PED staffing and our crisis, sort of a crisis focus this year. Private sector partners and co-chairs were um, focusing on other triage for much of the year. So I know our, our uh, marketing team capacity was strained with Bridge Fund, and I think our PIO was assigned to the Emergency Operations Center for much of the year. So, so it was a challenge, to kind of, to get you know to get the word out. Um, so, $150,000 for new tech fund was suspended and still available for 21. So we'll be able to go forward with that into this year, and then. Um, Again, the necessary potential for tech-driven economic recovery remains high. So, the 2021 budget, bringing that 300, uh, bringing the 265 estimated rollover balance, and a $300,000 annual investment request for this year. 245,000 for scholarships for tech training to complement Ramsey County Workforce Solutions contributions. 50,000 for communications and marketing contract support to boost program outreach and reinforce St. Paul as a place for innovation-focused business growth. 45,000 for event sponsorship. 
um, as I mentioned, and a couple of others that are mentioned there, code switch and mini demo. 150,000 for investments in high potential tech startup business recruitment, accelerator and incubator growth and development, um, and tech, <coughs> I'm sorry, tech training center development. And finally, 75,000 for specialized technical assistance for brick and mortar businesses such as restaurants, so they can do their to-go online or expand their tech capacity. That has kept many businesses and restaurants alive over this time period. Uh, Ms. Goodman, it looks yes. like we have a question from Ms. Dinker. Absolutely. Yes, Thanks, thank Council you. President. Um, Director Goodman, I'm I'm wondering about, I, I completely agree with you on, on the value of full stack, um, but I, I can't help but notice that the annual budget is now close to having doubled um, since we started the program. Mm -hmm. And I, I see there's amounts allocated for each of these different um, things, these different parts of the program, but I guess I'm wondering, um, what, what's the rationale for this dramatic increase in the amount of funding? And is there sort of like a, um, is the sky's the limit on this program? Because it seems like we could always kind of keep doing more scholarships. Is there sort of a long-term plan in terms of how much money we want to be allocating to full stack compared to many of these other um, PED needs, our, our reserve that we know is in danger? Um, just kind of, can you talk a little bit about why the, the near doubling of this amount? Absolutely, thank you, thank you, Councilmember Naker. Um, I had again similar questions. We thought we thought this through a little bit. A lot of it is, you know, rolling over uh, because we had so much interruption in the ability to implement uh, over the past year. Um, and in looking at, do we just take some of these funds and put them toward our um, toward a, a deficit, or do we try? Um, again, I believe this is the program where we can make the most impact in our COVID recovery. If we are unable to implement all of these programs and there are funds remaining, we will put them back in the towards the deficit in the reserves. Um, but I would like we would like to to budget to really try to to lean in on this program this year. I think this is the program that um, that can really have the most impact in in some of the recovery for businesses. So. But for certain, to, to be clear, if, if we if we are not able to, even largely maybe based on capacity, if the capacity to implement this much um, this much programming at this level isn't there, then then we would put the money back into the deficit in the fund. Okay, thanks. I, I think it'll be really important to check in on that at the end of the year because one could also argue that we have almost the entire year's budget that we can roll over from last year, um, 265,000. And given the challenges of using it last year, those might also or this past year apply to next year. Um, so I, I, I hope we can check back in on how we spent these dollars at the end of the year. Absolutely. I actually thank you, Council Member. I believe we can probably give you a. Uh, um, an update at the end of yes, at the end of 2020, because though we do have a, a, roll, a rollover bounce, we do also have some spending to do this year. So, but thank you for that question. Are there any other questions on full stack before I move on? I do. Does not look like there are questions. Okay, thank you so much, Council President. Okay, a couple more slides. Um, the the you had asked. There was a question about the status of the data management system and the business process documentation. So as you know, PED um, has investment data. The investment data being what we spend on on programs and um, uh, on what we spend on programs. And we have it in spreadsheets. And it, there's not uh, there are, there is not a system, a centralized system to ensure that they're consistent. Uh, that that staff can be trained as they come in. That we're frankly that we're that we're in compliance. We need to really do a better job of tracking. So a hundred thousand dollars was budgeted in 2020 to define the system, and the system has for the has been the system requirements have been determined. They've been completed and are being reviewed by OTC and by our PED leadership. Two hundred thousand in 2021 will be invested in actually building the system, establishing the protocols, and training staff. Um, an additional 100,000 was budgeted for a consultant to assist with the business process documentation and streamlining. That that just hasn't. It was it, the work was to be led by by the deputy director who um, who was doing two jobs over the past year with the depart the departure in July of the director and then um, her being the interim. So it just it just hasn't happened yet, but the dollars budgeted will be carried forward to 2021 or returned to the parking fund if if again if not. Um, if if not implemented, but that's the plan for that. Ms. Anchor. 
Thank you. So this is a similar question to the last one on full stack in terms of unspent funds. But so just to be clear, we had $200,000 budgeted in 2020 that have not been spent for this purpose. And we're talking about now budgeting an additional, is it 200,000 or 100,000 for 2021? So we had 20, the 200,000 for 2021 is to build the system. Mm -hmm. The 100,000, um, I'm sorry, Deputy Director Gill, you'll have to clarify for me, was 100,000 in 2020 that was budgeted and it just hasn't been spent yet? Director Goodman, Council President, Council Member Naker, yes, that's correct. So there were there were two pieces budgeted in 2020. There was a hundred thousand for the data management system, and then there was a, a separate effort that we were going to pursue um, with a hundred thousand dollars budgeted for consulting services for business process improvements and documentation. The data management system has moved forward. Others on the PED team have taken that ball and continued to move it forward. The, the business process improvement and documentation work has not yet gotten started. So we will have spent the 100,000 on data management. We're requesting another 200,000 to build that system and define the system protocols and make sure that our staff are trained appropriately for using it. So really launching it in 2021. And then we have $100,000 that was budgeted in 2020 for the business process improvement work that we're deciding how we how we would move forward with that if, we, if we're going to still move forward with consultant resources for that then we would ask to carry those dollars over. Um, but if, if we decide on a different approach we may return those dollars to the to the parking fund. And will we know that before the end of our budgeting process, I, in terms of whether or not this hundred thousand is being budgeted for the process analysis in twenty twenty one, Council President, Council Member Naker, um, yes, if if we were going to carry the dollars forward, that would have to be part of the budgeting process. So we will we're evaluating that now, um, and we'll have a better sense of that still within this year's budget process. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, on, on this, and perhaps you've made this abundantly clear, but I think one one thing that's really crucial as we um, re, uh, create these systems, which are so desperately needed, I worry so much about systems that are half in people's heads and half in people's file cabinets and half in obsolete um, platforms and software programs that it is so important that we do this work. And I, I think we need to do this on a citywide basis as well. Um, have we've talked with our DSI about our Amanda program, which is just, you know, basically limping across the finish line right now. Um, I think it's very important that we use a system as we move forward that is um, widely used, um, that it can be uh, continue to be upgraded and updated, that folks coming into a position in PED can easily learn, um, and that is a transferable skill. I, I'm worried sometimes when we start building out our own systems <laughs> that they become very um, singular in purpose and and on and the they become hard to manage and maintain. So um, I'm very very supportive of this work, and I just want to make sure that we're using um, end up using programs and platforms that are consistent with um, what the rest of the industry uses, so that it maintains its relevance over time. Thank you, Council President. I have the exact same concerns. <laughs> so um, I haven't been here long enough yet to, I have not yet even seen what we've done, you know, so far. Um, I went through a similar process to this in my previous position. So um, I've been through sort of some evaluation of, of some right. systems that may or may not be adequate for what we need, but so we're, we're looking closely at that as we evaluate how to move forward. Also, That's working, fantastic. Also That's working, fantastic. Oh, good. Thank you. Also working with the CAO's office because there's that compliance piece that really needs to be part of it as well. So, um, okay. I have one more slide and I know we're probably running short on time. Oh, hold on. Um, there were questions about the vacancies uh, in the presentation. It said eight, eight staff vacancies were held for all or part of 2020 and that we had prioritized which to fill based on customer service and core operations. Two of those are proposed to be held through the end of 2021. So this chart will show you when the, each position became vacant, um, and, and it's in the order of when they became vacant, and then when we anticipate they 
either have been filled or will be filled. So some of them were filled over over the year of, over in 2020, the towards the end um, or in the middle. And then, um, but the grants manager and the loan servicing. So two two you know fairly higher level positions we will be holding through all of 2021. We won't be we won't be filling those this in the coming year. And I just didn't have the answer to that question when it was asked at the last presentation. So got clarification on that. Ms. Goodman, are you getting support on grants um, from the the chiefs um, in the mayor's office? I know I, I feel like um, Mr. Stark is has been very focused on delivering grants for the cities and wondering if some of that work is being picked up by um, other uh, staff in this uh, mayor's office or across the city. The grants manager work. Uh, honestly, Council President, I don't know the answer to that question, but it's something I can look into. Okay, and it, it's it was more a curiosity. It's not something that you should spend a ton of time on. Okay, okay, that concludes my presentation. I know we've still got a couple more to do. Um, are there any other questions at this time, or anything else that we can follow up on for any of you? Um, I'm not seeing hands up. Sometimes things uh, okay. pop up after meetings and we'll follow up through Holly if um, other um, items come up. But I do appreciate um, the follow up, the information. Um, it's uh, just I, digging in. Jane Prince here. I have a question. Yes. I, I don't know if you can't see my hand, Council President, but um, the question is, Ms. Goodman, I, in this, is nothing that was part of your presentation today, but I've gotten calls from a couple of our housing advocates about a recent emergency notification system um, notice that went out that we're going to be shifting um, $584,000 from our home grant from HUD for affordable housing from providing housing into administration. And um, there, and I don't know if this is part of the budget process, um, but in any event, I, I think we're gonna need some answers on that because I have, I have emailed the staff person who was listed on the um, ENS report. But um, in any event, I just wanted to get that in there because the, um, the advocates are concerned about it, and I and I share their concern. It's almost six hundred thousand dollars that won't be going into affordable housing in twenty and twenty for twenty and twenty one. Hmm. Thank you, Council Member. I I don't know. If, is there anyone on my staff who has any detail about that at all? If not, we we'll, we will follow up. Director Goodman, uh, Kristen Guild here, um, Council President Brenmo, and Council Member Naker. Um, that notice was connected to um, uh, an amendment that we need to make to the HUD consolidated plan, which is um, a requirement of HUD for um, for our full array of, um, <clears throat> of federal HUD grants that we receive. Um, for home, um, the, the CARES Act allowed for municipalities to, um, to charge more of our staffing costs to program administration, um, understanding that, um, that our staffing costs are going up with COVID as we're um, working harder um, to, deliver, to deliver the community benefits that we need to um, with those grant dollars. Um, so usually the home, uh, the home grants are capped at 10%. For, um, for staffing costs. Um, and that doesn't actually cover all of our staffing costs um, for investing in, in home projects. Um, under the CARES Act, they did allow for municipalities to charge up to 25% um, to the home grant um, for staffing costs that are directly tied 
to home projects and to delivering the affordable housing uh, preservation and production that is funded by home. Um, we don't necessarily anticipate that we would charge all of, you know, up to that full cap, um, but we do have costs of greater than 10% um, for delivering affordable housing funded by home. Um, so the change that we're proposing to the consolidated plan is just to allow us that additional flexibility to charge our true staff costs back to the home program. And that ties back to Director Goodman's original um, budget presentation, where she noted that we're going to we're going to be doing a better job of charging our eligible staff costs to to grant funding when we are able to. This is just a, a step in that direction. Um, we're not anticipating that there would be an impact to the a significant impact to the projects that we're able to fund with home. Um, these are dollars that we would be um, that we would be tapping for staff costs over probably a few years. Um, thanks for that. Does that mean that that when we, you know, if it's not a COVID year, that the 10 percent we're allowed never covers our project costs? Of, of using those funds? Council President and Council Member Prince, yes, that is correct. That 10% cap is, is never enough to, to cover our staff costs. We yeah. are subsidizing home projects as a city. Okay, well, that that is, that is really, that's an issue that I suppose we should be raising with HUD if anyone was listening. Um, but that's, that's good to know. And, and I would suggest that we put together some kind of a response that we can get out to the to the advocacy community on that because that makes sense and and rather than my trying to paraphrase it, you know, I I will share with you the the um, the groups I've heard from so far. But thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Prince. And we will definitely put together um, an explanation. And if you have suggestions on who we might share that with, and we'll try to get it out to others that we expect would, would be interested in that explanation as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. All right. Now it looks like we do not have further questions. So let's move on. I believe um, Susan Earle is making the next presentation. Welcome, yes. Ms. Earle. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I'll get my screen shared. So I'm going to um, let me know if you'd like a different order, but I, I was going to start with STAR and then um, move to CIB if that works for everybody. I think that sounds fine. Wonderful. So can you all see my screen with the presentation, the STAR budget? Yep. Great. Um, so good morning, uh, Susan Earle, budget manager for the city in uh, Office of Financial Services. I'm gonna walk through um, a couple slides on STAR this morning. I'll make sure my notes up too. Um, and then PED staff is here as well uh, to talk about any program changes. Um, the presentation is, or program questions, excuse me. The presentation is really uh, focused on the budget side, but um, as always, let me know if there are questions. Happy to um, take a break and answer any questions that we have as we go. Um, so I'll start with what's new in STAR uh, for 2021. Um, oh, I'll say it too. I'm going to talk both about 2021 and then a little bit of an update on 2020, um, but kind of speak about them separately. Uh, so we don't, it's hard to do. I know two budgets um, at one time, which we've been all been doing all year. So I'm going to start with 2021 um, and then we'll do a 2020 update after the 2021 discussion. Um, so this is just some updates on uh, where we're at with STAR and what the projected negative uh, variance is. And so this is um, looking at what we've included here is just some information on what the state was projecting um, for STAR revenue uh, losses in their 2020 February forecast, which is a good indicator of where sales tax is going to be headed. Um, and also just a note for some context that food and beverage industries um, account for almost 24% of our sales tax in 2018. And so we know that those um, industries are taking a hit. And so just to share, this is the kind of information that we've been monitoring um, and looking at all year to really understand where are we headed with sales tax um, and try and get out the crystal ball and, and figure out what to budget for 2021, um, which we still know is, is still pretty far away the whole year. 
um, and sort of seeing how that whole um, sales tax collection for 2021 will go. Um, but this is this is really the the framework and informing the 2021 what we're gonna um, for our budget. Um, the other change, and you'll see it when we look at the actual star budget on the next slide, um, but there's an additional transfer to the River Center for economic development purposes that we've also included in the um, star budget this year. So hopefully um, this is somewhat readable. Uh, I think we've sent this to Holly uh, as a, a um, separate PDF or a file as well. I know the slides make it a little hard, but the, there's a lot going on in STAR um, that I want to make sure we uh, can get the full picture of the budget in front of you all. Um, so this is the 2021 sales tax budget. We are assuming um, you can see up here for our 2021 sales tax collections, um, 16.875 million. This is down from 18.75 budgeted in 2019 and in 2020. Um, I won't read through every line and then I'll, I'll just give a couple highlights and then pause if there are questions. Um, but one thing I wanted to highlight is that this line, the revenue or in the sources side, um, sales tax above 2019 budget, we've allocated then down here on line 15 um, for a year round star. And so I think this was a question early on and just wanted to make sure we were clear, this isn't a repurposing of any balances or anything like that. It's an additional, um, we, we typically see, you know, we, we budget and then have a, a sales tax collection over budget. Um, this year we've taken that and put that into the year round star allocation. So that's what this line is. I know it's a little different than we've done in the past, but put that right into the um, proposed budget this year for 2021. Um, and then I mentioned also the um, transfer for the River Center is also in here, this million dollar line um, for economic development or economic development purposes. Um, the rest of the changes are really just adjustments to programs um, with the reduced revenue uh, that we're expecting in 2021. Um, obviously, we've got our debt, our pledge debt obligations. I think this is a slight change to the format. So we kind of called out where our um, debt obligations were specifically. And then from there, we can see the impacts of the reduced revenue um, on the rest of the spending, largely on the program side um, with our debt. You know, debt transfers still need to be made. Um, we still have costs related to the city fleet that we budget. So um, can kind of see how the rest of that has flown through the formula with the reduced revenue um, estimates for 2021. And so I'll pause there and see if there are, there are questions there's or, a, yeah, there's we'll a take question. a break. I think there's a question. Yep. Thanks, Council President. Thanks, Ms. Earl. Um, a couple of questions. One is, I know that our sales tax uh, statute requires that 60% of our total amount go to Neighborhood Star, 10% to Cultural Star, and then the remainder to make the River Center whole. Mm -hmm. um, at, just looking at the top line, it doesn't seem like those percentages are being borne out. Am I, what am I missing? Um, so, so this document is tough and we, we try to talk about this, this, we don't use this necessary as our compliance document because we are trying to highlight a lot of things. Like for example, we've got loan repayments in here, um, that aren't necessarily, I believe governed by the statute. I think Mr. Solomon can jump in if I'm, um, or Mr. McCarthy can let me know if I'm wrong on that. Um, but like the, so the, we've really got the sales tax collections. We've got our prior years, um, we've got interest earnings. So so we don't use this document. We just say it's not necessarily our, our what we use to check against our compliance. Um, with the state law, it's really to say overall what is happening in the sales tax program. Um, we can follow up and get you know a different view of this if, if that would be helpful. I think it's hard to kind of tease all that out um, with the buckets and the way that we've typically shown it in this format. That would be helpful because I, sure. I understand that it's but high level, we're not putting, according to this document, if these are the right numbers, 60% is not going to Neighborhood Star, 10% is not going to Cultural Star. So I think that follow-up would be really helpful. Sure. Um, and then just a question about the, the line 13, reducing Neighborhood Star to pay for Housing Trust Fund and RCVA ongoing, the 1.4 million. Mm -hmm. um, we are paying for the Housing Trust Fund in line 24 with 1.4 million. Yep. Why are we also taking away from Neighborhood Star for that? And what's the RCVA ongoing? And is this different this year from previous years? Um, I, uh, Council President Brendan and Council Member Nieker, this is this is really the number. This is kind of showing where the um, decreases relative to the overall program. Um, so this was a line that I believe was carried over from 2020 as well. And it's sort of the decision was made that the neighborhood star would be the place that we adjust um, for the housing trust fund. So that it's just kind of showing where that, um, how we had to balance out those costs relative to the um, to the budget for, for the 
neighborhood star program and then for the additional funding for the housing trust fund. Um, I'm, I'm trying to read your, I don't think I'm answering your question. And well, so I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. I just want to make sure looking I'm overly perplexed. And, no, that's I, fine. So, so I understand we're giving 1.4 million to the housing trust yep. fund from our, from, on line 24. Yep. And then number, line 13, we're reducing our amount of neighborhood star for the housing trust fund. I guess I don't understand what that means. We're, we're taking it from there to move to the other column. Right. So, so Council President Brandon and Council Member Nieger, the way then to get the star total for like the actual um, grants available for Neighborhood Star are these two lines together. And so I think we were just trying to highlight, like I said, I think it's a holdover from last year when this was really, I believe, the first time that it showed up in this um, way of the, the continued funding plan for the Housing Trust Fund um, of, of not just showing a net number, but trying to show that there is an impact of saying the Neighborhood Star program is impacted by the decision, um, the decisions that have already been made around the Housing Trust Fund. Okay, so this is the same as what we were doing in previous years for the Housing Trust Fund. Yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, and just lastly, lastly, the line for Cultural Star for Library Materials, 19, 175,000. Is that, I seem to remember we do that year over year, but I just wanted to confirm that. Uh, Council President Brent Moan and Council Member Naker, yes, we do that um, both, uh, every year. That's a line in there. Thanks. Yep. So that's not a new. It's it's not additional relative to like any sort of previous. It's um, continuing. It's the same thing from 2020 and continuing that in 2021. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, we'll we'll make a note and and get the follow up. Um, Council Member Naker that you requested. And if there are others, I know that this is, like I said, a lot to take in. So um, Holly does a great job of getting questions over to us. So if folks have questions following the presentation on, on details that are included in um, the spreadsheet, we're happy to make sure you all get your questions answered. Um, so the last um, last slide on 2021, just the update on uh, the sales tax debt outstanding. This is what we still have outstanding that's paid for with sales tax. Um, Mr. Solomon's on the call as well if there are specific questions about any of the bond issues um, that we have outstanding, but wanted to make sure this list was in front of you all. And then um, just some takeaways. I think we've already covered a little bit the housing trust fund in its third year. Um, we're de decreasing our transfers for geo debt. Um, we've increased that transfer, as I highlighted on the previous slide, for River Center economic development purposes, and then really driven by the economic outlooks um, and our budget um, or our, our projections for sales tax, seeing a decrease in the neighborhood and cultural star programs in um, 2021. And you, you said that Mr. Solomon's on the call, and perhaps this is um, um, a question for him, but I'm basically are based on what we're hearing about interest rates I'm wondering if we'll be seeing significant amount of refunding of our bonds um and if that um is partially reflected in the decrease of transfers to the geo debt um that would definitely be a question for Mr. Solomon so if he's has a minute and wants to answer that that'd be helpful hey, yeah hi council president Brent Mullen. uh thank you for the question um our uh, city debt presentation is actually coming up, I believe, next Wednesday, and we'll have a lot of information on that. And, and you're exactly right. We're looking at a large um, percentage of the debt portfolio that um, could be refinanced, and we're planning to uh, move on that in the next year. Um, unfortunately, none of the sales tax debt falls into that category, but but in the geo debt portfolio, that's exactly right. So you'll see that uh, next week. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, if there are no other questions on 2021, uh, I did also want to provide an update on 2020. Um, as we know, 2020 has been hard on all city revenues. Um, this gives a history of where our sales tax revenues have been and then an updated um, 2020 year to date. And so right now we're seeing um, uh, as still a negative variance in our sales tax revenue. Um, and this is really driving what um, we've made for adjustments in the 2020 budget and the 2020 um, cultural and neighborhood programs. Uh, we had originally projected uh, a 10 to 12% decrease um, after we saw um, particularly this May variance. Um, we've been seeing that come back a little bit. So our current projection um, is closer to 5 to 7% of a negative variance through year end. Um, but we're continuing to monitor as we have that um, every month we get more, you know, better and, and more complete information on 2020 and where we're going to land. Um, so then the... Uh, Ms. Ms. Earl, be, Ms. Earl, before you move on, and this, yeah. 
this may be um, kind of an uninformed question, but um, I know that online sales um, and you know companies like Amazon are seeing huge increases in sales in um, in COVID, and I know that there was recently a fairly recently a change in collection of sales tax for those types of purchases. Do those go through the state before they come to us or do we get any of those revenues directly? Um, Council President Brenmon, I'll I'll give a first answer and then Mr. Salman can jump in if I'm if I misstate anything. Everything does come through the state. So they do our collections and then remit it back to us. Um, so all of that does, uh, you know, anything we have for sales tax. And take a fee and take a fee, right? And take a fee. They do. Um, <laughs> So that, yeah, so that's that's sort of the high level, the, the process. I don't know if, um, Mr. Zalm, if you want to add anything on that process or other details to add. I'm, I'm just also wondering if it has, if it, if those online sales have something to do with the relatively, I mean, I would expect the, this number to be way higher than five to six, um, just given, our, you know, what's happened this year. So I'm, I'm wondering like what's helping offset that or if, if, we're doing um, more ordering and to go, or I, it's. I'm just curious what would, uh, what would be the cause of that um, adjustment there? Yes. Yeah, so, Council President Brenmon, um, I, I think it's a good question. Um, historically, St. Paul has um, retained pretty strong sales tax revenues throughout the Great Recession, for example. Obviously, we're in unprecedented times. Um, and, you know, as some of those actuals were coming in, I think Susan has some points on, on the great job OFS has done kind of projecting these and, and keeping up with, with a moving target. Um, when it comes to specifics in sales tax, we don't get a ton of information since a lot of the sales tax returns are private data, um, but we do work with the Department of Revenue regularly to kind of learn what we can. Um, to, to your point on the online sales, um, that was a, obviously a big uh, change and it's something that we've tracked. And to be honest, we really haven't seen the full impact of that that we expected. And um, you know that's something we've been talking about Department of Revenue with uh, about, but um, I mean, then when you look at all these different things that are impacting collections, it's kind of hard to really settle on one uh, defining uh, uh, um, level or area where the sales tax has been strong. So it's something we're looking at. Um, and, and like I said, I think we have some more details on how we've kind of tracked projections here. Um, but, but it's a lot of different factors. And I think looking historically, St. Paul has kind of remained a little bit stronger than uh, the state and the nation um, when it tracks to sales tax in recessionary periods. Okay, thank you for that. And I see Ms. Prince has her hand up. I would just add that um, before we move on from this, just that um, I know that initially Minneapolis with its big convention center and the downtown commercial district really was struggling um, with this in a way that St. Paul, um, we saw that the gap was was less. And I think a lot of it has to do with that kind of downtown cash cow that's, that is Minneapolis. Um, I will, um, Ms. Prince. Well, Ms. Prince, did you have a question? I do. Um, this is just a clarification. So regarding the online sales tax, do the actuals on this chart reflect those as well? Or does that come in a different way at a different time? Or um, Council President Brandmo and Council Member Prince, this chart reflects all of our sales tax. So there's no, it all comes in the same um, way and gets remitted to us the same, you know, at the same time okay. every month. Yep. So, so it's the online stuff too? Yes, anything that we're collecting that's eligible for the local sales tax in St. Paul comes in through this um, and, and is reflected on this um, uh, um, chart in this information. Yep. Thanks. And, and Council Member, or Council President Brenmo and Council Member Prince, I just might add, we, we don't get data that separates those out, unfortunately. So again, it's a new development, something we're working with Department of Revenue on, but I think that would be a helpful data point um, if they could provide that to us. So something we're working on. And Ms. Prince and others, like um, as as often as the case, as we talk, as we go through our um, you know policy conversations in the spring, it leads us to our budget season in the fall, and I think budget season in the fall sometimes leads us to policy sessions in the spring. And perhaps this is something that we should dig into. I, I think it's very interesting. I see the Justice Department is um, taking an action against Google, and I'm looking at these large conglomerate um, mega companies and their impact on. Um, well, on all of us. And so I think that understanding um, what contributions are coming back to, uh, to the state and to the city uh, is is very um, relevant. The Amazon trucks I see driving around the city are riding on our streets. 
um, as their mode of commerce and they are not contributing to our street reconstruction. So um, understanding like how those things all layer together, I think would be very interesting if, if um, my colleagues would agree. Yeah, that, that sounds great. 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 Um, I'll just go to the next slide with the, um, oh, there we go. Um, so just a uh, you know similar same information, um, but just with a graph kind of showing our 2020 um, year to date variance from budget. And so uh, I'll just I guess I would take this opportunity again to just say we're we're monitoring this really closely. I think um, it's it's fair to say that we we are doing our best to figure out what is going to happen in sort of these uncertain it's uncertain times and not knowing what's going to happen with the virus through the end of the year. Um, and we, we do put a lot of thought into, well, what's driving this? Why is this changing? Why are we seeing this trend and things that are expected or unexpected, um, you know, in terms of the revenues? And, and I just would commend OFS and, and particularly um, Sarah Brown does a lot of work in our treasury group to um, keep an eye on this and, and not just kind of report the actuals that come in, but really look at the trends around it to see what's happening. And um, every month we, you know, we can get more accurate sort of towards our year end um, projections. And so just so you all know, it's something that we're, we are watching closely and we have a process that we process um, that we've been following all year to keep an eye on these and all of our city revenues. So it looks like Ms. Naker has a question. Thank you, Council President. Thanks, Ms. Earl. And um, you never want to see a trend line doing what this trend line on the graph is doing <laughs> right. in a budget presentation, but I am struck and I, I'd love your thoughts on this. It 5.3% under budget, 9.1% less than 2019. I guess I would have assumed we would see much more dramatic mm -hmm. impact on the sales tax collections. Um, and I'm, and it's actually, I mean, I'm, I'm cautiously buoyed by the fact that it seems like our sales tax is somewhat more resilient than I would have thought, even during this, um, you know, pandemic of all pandemics and crazy times. So, can can you speak a bit to that? Do we expect this to? Are we not seeing the full effects yet, or what are we? How what are we? imagining this is based on or projecting? Sure. Um, I think at the beginning, we, so like I you know, mentioned earlier, we've got the, oh, I'm sorry, Council President Bremon and Council Member Naker. We've got um, sort of the beginning we saw, or, and I think we're really worried about a real cliff, um, especially when it came to like the unemployment, you know, just a lot of the initial economic indicators we have. Um, as Mr. Solomon mentioned, it's tough because we don't get that detail. Um, so we were sort of an initially looking at, okay, well, what what is our historic breakdown of sales tax been? And are those the industries that are being hit by the pandemic? And so we started basing our projections on that. Um, all theoretical, right? It's, it's again, it's hard when we don't have the data, but um, the stimulus I think helps that folks still had money to spend. Um, so we probably weren't seeing the impact that we would have if we, you know, if that money hadn't come through in the unemployment um, for the first half of the year. Um, and then I think there's just there as as the as the months continue, we you know we have to make some assumptions about what people are and aren't buying. And now we're seeing where people actually are spending a money and where that um, local sales tax is coming in. So I think we're we're seeing a combination of it. And I um, and there were also honestly just sometimes that we just went, well, that's interesting. <laughs> you know, we'd see I think it was April or May we saw like a big jump, and there were theories about well, everybody went out and bought computers and bought things to work from home, or everybody bought new. Um, you know, everybody bought their kids' desks to work from, you know, do school from home. And so, you know, some of that is theorizing about, well, what did we think was going to happen? And then what do we see in the actual, you know, local national trends? Um, I, and I know my, and Mr. Salman mentioned this too. I wish we had more specifics about what's driving this. Um, and sort of what the breakdown is and where we're seeing a trend over time. Unfortunately, that's just not data that we get um, very readily from the Department of Revenue. So we're sort of, um, and in this case, doing a little more of reading the tea leaves and sort of some analysis around the the trends versus having being able to give you a specific on, um, you know, this this sector or that sector really um, outperformed relative to what we thought was going to happen in March, April, May. So. And I, I think, Ms. Anker, to the, our earlier point, it, this would be something where having the Department of Revenue come in and talk to us would be helpful. I mean, even just listening to what Ms. Earl said, I think about where are we buying desks and buying computers in St. Paul City limits? You know, I'm... I'm imagining these things in Roseville and Bloomington, but um, but in any case, it'd be interesting to understand. Um, to understand, I think it's it's um, fascinating and and also it sounds like historically um, pretty consistent. So um, I see Ms. Goodman. Ms. Goodman, you have a hand up. Yes, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, um, I can now. 
Just as a comparison, just as a point of information, I'm, of course, I'm still following Oklahoma City a bit because I'm still subscribed to everything. And they were expecting a 12% drop in sales tax revenue, and it had a 4% drop over this time period. So uh, I think just spending is still happening in different ways. Um, and same, they have the same questions, Council President, that, that all of you have is looking into how, how that's occurred, but um, they were expecting a, a cliff that was much more steep than, than the decline that they had as well, just for comparison. Interesting, thank you. Yeah. All right, great. Um, the last slide I've got on uh, STAR for you all today. Um, so just looking at the program adjustments. So uh, as we, you know, did our projections and as we've seen, um, as we're, you know, we're, we're, we're finding our projections all the time, but we knew we weren't going to hit our budget this year. Um, you know, that was pretty certain early on. Um, so we have uh, reduced uh, or we've, we've made plans with PED to lower the cultural STAR budget. Um, and the neighborhood star. Um, I should I guess we haven't. I should say we haven't amended the budget yet. That will. That's the last um, bullet here. Will be coming with a budget amendment before year end. Um, but we've. Uh, you know, PED has taken steps to not fully allocate the 2020 budget because we knew all that funding wouldn't be there. Um, so our our plan is to come back with uh, a final resolution to amend um, the 2020 sales tax budget based on you know the best projections we can get and and hopefully getting like one more month of data in before we kind of finalize those and amend the budget. Um, since it will likely be, you know, knock on wood, better than um, our original sort of worst case projections that we had to put in place as the programs are moving forward earlier this year. Um, I just wanna make sure it's clear that these won't be, you know, this money will then kind of come back again as we get our final and we'll have the similar process to above budget um, sales tax collection. So there's not really a way to, you know, to sort of redo the 2020 um, project or the 2020 program right now but we will be having sort of our final projections to compare to. And then if we do outperform budget, you know, that's something that will stay in the sales tax program and be able to be reallocated in the future. So it's a little bit of a different process. Usually we, you know, are here, we kind of budget conservatively and then we've got a little bit of, you know, prior year above budget to bring into the next budget process. Um, I think that's likely, again, knock on wood, what will happen, but it'll be relative to a, a revised, a downwardly revised um, projection at year end. Ms. Earl, I am going to ask you this question at potential um, at my peril. <laughs> um, but I, I, one of the things I think that, especially given the recent conversation about the um, justifying or not justifying, but um, uh, the 2020 budget true up um, amendment that will be coming in uh, next week. Um, we continue to say we can't, we have to have these contracts out. We have to spend this money in 2020 there. We cannot roll it over to 2021 and just add it to the next year's pot. But nevertheless, all day in this budget meeting, we're talking about rolling over money in the HRA fund. And I'm wondering if you can distinguish between just for, for all of our sakes, why, um, with our general fund and council dollars or the city's budget, we cannot, um, and why with HRA, we can. Uh, Council President Brennan, great question. Um, really, the, the distinction comes down to a you know general fund versus a special fund budget and like the source of the of the dollars. Um, so, for example, for the sales tax, that, those dollars can't be used for any other purpose, right? So we we repurpose those and put them back into you know according to the special law what they're budgeted for, um, and they sit in their own separate fund balance. They sit, you know, just within the sales tax program um, or within the HRA, within the, um, you know, the HRA funds that um, are identified and that aren't spent and, and that maybe have a balance that um, that accumulates. So when we actually adopt the budget, we are able to then move those dollars forward and we essentially budget it as a use of fund balance because it's the same process. It's that the, the funding falls, you know, falls to fund balance. Um, and then in the next year, we reuse that because it can't be used for anything but the purpose for that special fund. Um, in the general fund, it falls to fund balance and then is in our general fund fund balance, supports that um, you know, 15% policy with our goals of moving more into that 20 to 30% range. And if we started um, using those dollars, you know, and holding them and carrying them over, uh, we would we would be essentially taking it out of that general fund fund balance. And we really, th that fund balance needs to grow every year um, in order to keep meeting our at least 15% minimum because it's a 15% of the, you know, 15% of the budget and every year that the budget grows, um, this year notwithstanding, you know, those dollars need to keep up. And so some of it's like a financial management um, 
tool. The other thing I'll add is that those are really for general purposes. And, and when we think about like sort of the theory around property taxes and the, and the dollars that go into it, um, people paid property taxes for services that were provided this year. So using, you know, 2020 property taxes to pay for like 2021, 22, 23, um, you know, general operating purposes, just like as a practice is something that we'd want to avoid. I don't know right. if that if, if there's more that I can add, but that's sort of the high level, I would say on the distinction. No, nope, that's my understanding as well. And I just, it's very complex. And um, so I just thought it was a good opportunity to um, reiterate why it's such a different, HRA is a special fund. It's a very mm -hmm. different um fund of money and we can treat it very differently. Um, I'm going to call on Ms. Naker also at my own peril. <laughs> this is a complicated thing and I don't want it to get too complicated here, but um, it looks like I, we have a follow-up. I know. I'm, I will comment at my own peril, but I will keep it unperilous hopefully for everybody else and stay high level. But I just wanted to clarify what, I, I appreciate the question, Council President, because I wondered the same thing. And Ms. Earl, it sounded like what you said is that if we don't spend general fund this year, it falls into fund balance, just like a special fund falls into a special fund 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 balance. And if we don't spend a dollar this year, we we could take it take, take that dollar out of next year's fund balance without hurting our overall fund balance, right? Because it went in, it could come out. Um, sounds like there's no technical reason why we can't do that, except that we generally want fund balance to grow. But if it's at 15%, it's where we want it to be. So, I mean, can you just, am I right about that? Like, there's no difference in being able to take general fund dollars, put them in fund balance and take them out next year, the same amount as there is, as we can do for special funds. Um, Council President Brenmon and Council Member Naker, I, I would say there are a couple differences. So the first is that um, the fund balance needs to like be keeping up with growth in the general fund. Um, and so if you if your budget grows and then you take your fund balance out, you're, you're hurting your fund balance policy even more than um, you would have if you know in the prior year, if you had spent it. Um, the other thing is that if you're thinking about, I, I think I come back to also the, um, uh, the the sort of the theory around when you're paying for services, and that's like I get it's a it's a more sort of um, like policy level, you know, policy discussion versus like a technical, you know, like does the council have the authority to do that? Um, you know, does the mayor have the authority to spend um, fund balance? Yes. But you know we don't it, we just don't want to get in a habit of really using like last year's money to pay for this year's services, um, and the um, 15 is really a floor. We know um, in talking to the rating agencies and in um, you know comparisons to other comparable cities, we're we're on the lower we're in a solid range, um, but we do have a goal and you know OFS has a goal in our um, you know operating in our uh, you know strategic plan to really be bolstering that fund balance and getting more into that 20 to 30 percent range. Um, so if we get in the habit of really just hovering around that 15%, um, the other thing it'll do is really limit our flexibility for times like this, where we, you know, we're really glad that we're not really scraping by just on that 15%. Um, but I agree, I hear you. And it's, it's a valid point that we, you know, we do treat the general fund differently than all the special funds. Um, but for all of those reasons. And so it isn't the same as, um, you know, the way we think about sales tax or the way that we think about other special funds. Um, but that's by design, you know, for the way that we want to manage our fund balance and, and mitigate that risk and the way that we want to have those services really be current current year services um, that we don't sort of hold over and then and save that money to spend in the next year. Well, I think the other thing you said was that the special funds have a particular purpose and things that cannot be spent on other items, whereas the general fund is, is a broad fund. So like trying to earmark something for one particular use is different than rolling it over um, from one fund, special fund, one year to the next, where that special funding line goes to this points to the same direction. Um, um, I appreciate the answers to the question. It's complicated, and I think the thing, at least for me, taken away today is um, in my mind, it's like, well, if we roll over, then we'll have more money. And it sounds like with inflation and increases in our general fund, the demand on the, the need for general fund reserves also increases. And so um, we're filling that gap as well. Um, very interesting conversation for some. <laughs> Let's appreciate your thoughts there. Thank you, Councilman President. Um, definitely a very interesting conversation for me. So hopefully others. <laughs> right on. Right. <laughs> Great. Um, so I, Council President Brenman, that's the last slide I have on um, STAR. 
and happy to you know note any other questions or um, you know discussion if, if folks have other questions for us or for um, the OFS or PED team. Uh, otherwise, the next thing up on the agenda is also me and I've got a the CAB presentation. So if you want to, I'm fine to do more star questions or should we move to CAB? We should shift gears. We have we are. Great. I'm looking at 11:25 on our schedule. Um, I think we can push ourselves out here to 11:45, um, but then we do have a, a council. Uh, agenda meeting at 11.45. So if we can keep in that 20 minute window, that would be appreciated. Got it. I will get my next presentation pulled up. Um, can everyone see my screen again? And now it should be the CAB presentation. Yep. Okay, great. Um, great. Um, so I will uh, do my best to balance time and, uh, but not not going too fast or speaking too quickly through all of the um, capital budget updates. Um, the items that we'll go through today is a summary of the 2021 CIB budget. Um, we've got some slides to highlight the changes for 2020 and 2021 relative to CIB. Um, I know there are some questions about just wanting to clarify. And again, I think this is a um, one of those places where we're doing similar things in both years in order to both adjust 2020 and, and solve the 2021 budget. So I want to make sure that the, the choices are clear on both of those as they relate to CIB. Um, and then this is actually the first year for our um, redesign process and having the community project recommendations. So have those to um, share with you all as well. So this is a summary of our 2021 proposed um, CIB. I won't read the slide um, at you all, but this is, you know, shows our total budget um, of 67.35 million and then lists out some of the major revenue sources that go in. Um, it's a pretty diverse set of revenues uh, for the CIB. And, you know, we have a lot of different pots that feed into the capital program for, um, for the city's capital spending every year. This is our um, just details on 2020 through 2024. I've we've kind of broken it out um, by uh, um, each plan, you know, two year planning cycle. So I think it's helpful to sort of think of them in a, in together because I know that that's what, um, you know, the CAB really considers them. And then we make adjustments um, obviously in the second year, but sort of keeping in mind, oops, sorry about that, where the, um, when CIB has it in front of them for a, you know, a quote unquote on year, um, they're really looking at the 2020, 2021. So we're in the second half of this um, planning cycle for, for the capital budget. Um, same thing, I guess I won't read um, everything on here and the 2021 proposed does reflect from changes from um, the tentative or the, the um, initial budget uh, last year. And so I'll have more details on that that highlight because I know, you know, for example, we know the North End Community Center is a change. Um, so this, this slide isn't meant to reflect those. This kind of gives the summary of what the spending is and then I'll have a slide on the, um, the details for what's changed in 2020. Um, this year, we do have a continued emphasis on facility maintenance, and so our citywide capital maintenance funding out of our um, bond-funded uh, projects. This is an addition, um, or additionally, we have the 600000 that we budget for citywide capital maintenance um, from the parking fund and that three-year um, commitment. So this is just the CIB bond side, but even in addition to these dollars, we are um, have a focus on facility maintenance and not only adding to what we have, um, but taking care of the assets that we already have in our system. Uh, Ms. Nicker has a question and then Ms. Prince. Thank you, Council President. Ms. Earl, this is just for, I think, everything on these slides. Um, it would be really helpful in the future to see a, a map of the city with dots for where different capital projects are going to be taking place, especially even for detail. Like if we know where the children's play area improvements are going to be happening, I think we do. I think it's Dane's Bluff, but um, we, it would be great to just see that on a map because otherwise it's really hard to tell where we're investing. And I think those are questions we get from our constituents all the time. Um, Council President Brenmon and Council President Naker, or Council President Brenmon, Council Member Naker, yes. Um, 
Madeline Mitchell and my staff actually reminded me that we we didn't include that um, and it was something that was on the list that we should have. So I'll apologize that we don't have that map and we can certainly get that. Um, that's something we can do and and we understand that that's really helpful to council members. So I apologize that it's not in the um, in the materials for today, but we will, we have that on our list. Great, Ms. Prince. Ms. Prince, you may have your mute on. Uh, yeah, and Ms. Earl, in the last slide uh, before this one, I, I wondered if you could just tell me what the thinking was. It it looks like um, removing the two million from uh, station seven, that that, that that funding went into the North End Community Center. Do you, do you can you explain um, what the thinking was there? Um, Council President Brenlon, Council Member Prince, I, yes, and I can actually, let me just see if it's the next. Can I, can we, can I put a pin in that? I, I do have a slide yeah. that's talking about yeah. sort of the changes. So, yep, that kind of sure. lays out all of the changes we made in, um, in the 2021 that, that gets at how, um, how we re, you know, how we made those changes for 2021, okay. if that's okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, So the this um, slide shows uh, information on our road and bridge projects um, that are um, slated for the CIB budget. Um, again, Council Member Naker, I totally hear your question, and I will be able to include um, you know a full set of information on where projects are happening. Um, but this shows what our um, St. Paul Streets program is um, expected to be funding, and then also um, where we've got our MSA projects for um, for 2021. Um, the next slide shows, so CDBG um, is also included in the capital process, and this lays out um, our funding for community partners that's included in the 2021 um, proposed budget. So maybe I'll pause and just like let folks kind of take a look and see if there's any questions. Um, PED staff is um, on the call as well if there are specific programmatic questions about CDBG, um, but this is the, the detail for our CDBG funding for 2021. Great. Um, also, CDBG funding funds in internal um, city programs as well. So for housing and economic development, um, this is a slate of projects that we have funded. And then we also include um, funding for a neighborhood play area. So the Dayton's Bluff play area um, is funded in 2021 out of CIB as well. Um, so the next slide, I think gets into, um, starts to answer some of the questions that I know folks had about uh, changes to CIB um, and the bond funded projects both in 20 and 21. Um, so this is a summary of what we're changing in the 2020 adopted CAB. This will be part of the resolution that comes before you next week as um, Council President Brenmo and you referenced the, um, the mid-year solution resolution. And so this um, repurposes uh, $2.9 million of, of CIB for eligible capital expenses that are paid for in the general fund. Um, so what you'll see in that resolution is a transfer of this amount um, to the general fund to cover mill and overlay expenses and um, public safety vehicle lease expenses that are bond eligible. Um, so this was just part of the overall solution that we had to come to to solve our 2020 budget um, problem. And so this leaves for station seven, um, leaves 500,000 for continued planning. Um, and, but re repurposes 1.5, uh, repurposes 800,000 of the Petro Park budget from 2019. And then these are balances from um, multiple prior year CIB projects that are completed and these um, balances are no longer needed. And so then this um, repurposes those dollar amounts as well. Ms. Prince. Yeah, and so there's no funding in 2021 for station seven. Um, council, oh, sorry, Council President Brenlon and Council Member Prince. Um, no, the 2021 um, removes the Station Seven. So I'm sorry, I jumped ahead to the next slide so y'all can see. Uh, the it removes the Station Seven funding. This did leave though um, 20. It left a dollars from 2019 as well. So this this slide now in 2020 just shows the um, 2020 budget amount that was changed. 
Okay, and and can you? I mean, what was the thinking on on taking that money that was supposed to be able to build Station Seven um, out of the out of the budget? Sure, um, Council President Brenmon and Council Member Prince, the it, I, I think it's Mayor Carter said it many times. This. 2020 and 21 has forced us to make a lot of decisions that we didn't really want to make. Um, and so needing to figure out how to solve a lot of the budget um, for both 2020 and 2021. Um, with Station 7, it wasn't, there wasn't any funding earmarked past uh, the 2021 budget. And, you know, so the funding identified wasn't necessarily enough to complete the project. Um, this leaves a million dollars in for 20, um, excuse me, for Station 7. Um, and able enables us to be able to plan um, and hopefully you know push that out a bit, but not totally take it off the table. Um, but that was just some of the thinking. There's just it's it was it's a tough budget year and needing to you know sort of take all of the options we have in order to solve you know both the 20 and the 2021. Okay, and I I mean obviously I I think a, a rec center is really important as well, but but there was a significant amount put in the North End Community Center. So um, in terms of cutting a fire station and funding um, a, a rec center, I mean, it, it wasn't a reduction. It it was um, moved into a different project. So I, I just want to note that. Um, and before we move on to the next question, I would just say that I'm delighted to see the funding in the North End Community Center. It's something that has also um, had significant planning dollars behind it and will make an impact on lives um, of kids in a community where 62% uh, of the population is under the age of 35 and um, a full 35% is under the age of 17. Um, so I'm glad to see that, on, but at the same time, I recognize that um, our public safety and fire station seven is also a priority. And I, I hear Ms. Earl talking about these um, tough decisions. One thing um, as we move forward in our conversations with Mr. Solomon about bonding, um, I, I think there's an opportunity given that we have, we'll have a design plan completed for fire station seven to look to our partners um, like the Port Authority to uh, consider doing some public safety bonding like they did for the Rowan Center, um, Public Safety Center uh, as, as an, a um, supplemental funding source for a capital improvement, um, as opposed to pitting the North End Community Center against a fire station, which I think isn't a good look. Um, I'd be really uh, very interested in pursuing public safety special bond um, to move forward with the fire station seven, um, given um, where it is along the design uh, plan phase as well. So just, I'd like to make sure that that gets uh, stated as well. Ms. Naker. Thanks, Council President. Um, I'm, I'm struck by the line on Pedro Park. Um, this is a complete surprise to me that $800,000 is proposed to be uh, repurposed from this funding line and, um, the last time my constituents heard about this project, Ackerberg was going to be doing a redevelopment of the public safety annex, and this money was supposed to go to a newly redesigned park that the community participated in the design of. Um, so, Ms. Earl, I don't expect that um, you can give the sort of reasoning behind this repurposing of these dollars, but I would be very interested to hear from PED or from parks about that. And um, I I personally am not going to be prepared to vote for this repurposing until um, there's been significantly more communication with the community than there has been to date about uh, what is going on in that parcel. Um, Council President Bradmon and Council Member Naker, one thing I'll add, and I know I'm um, Director Goodman, I might, if she wants to jump in as well, um, but I'll just say from sort of from the financing side, uh, you know this. There, right, there are questions, and I don't want to speak for PED or Parks about that. Um, but from the financing side, you know, we had sold bonds, and these bonds are really sitting there unspent. Um, and so, needing to figure out a plan forward um, for the park in the meantime, you know, being able to repurpose these dollars and use the bonds that were spent in order to again solve the solve our budget crisis that we're facing, um, and not have those you know bonds sit there uh, unused. Um, was part of the, you know, sort of from the financial side why this, you know, made some sense. Um, but I also don't, and I, I think I maybe cut off Director Goodman, so I apologize if she wanted to um, jump in and answer sort of more from the, the plan for the park and, and sort of where the project is headed. 
Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Council President Bermoen and, and Council Member Naker. I, I, I don't have enough information. I also would like to have more information and apologies that this is coming, um, that this is how, how, how this information is being presented at, at this late moment, but we will do, I will get further information. Um, I know Council Member Naker, you and I have talked about this a little bit the last couple of days and it's it's been on my radar and I've been asking questions, but I do not have enough information for you at this time to answer. And I will, um, I will follow up. Great, thank you. All right. Um, so just to, to round out sort of the um, changes to 2021, I wanna save a few minutes for the redesign update. Um, but this this um, slide lays out the changes. I think we've talked a lot of a lot of them already. Um, the you know in the library, um, I'll just jump to the Hayden Heights versus the library facility design. I think you know this is really speaking to their long term um, facilities and and strategic plan, and so keeping that moving forward. Um, we already talked about the North End Community Center. Uh, then and then we've just made some small tweaks to the add a little more to the capital maintenance program and um, our bond sale costs. And then also, and I think this is where it ties into sort of a, an, an overall update to the 2021 proposed is this mill and overlay program. And so this is again similar to what we did in 2020 for um, you know using bond um, using bonds and, and CAB bonds for capital eligible expenses in the general fund. So this is part of that same. Um, using that same opportunity and funding source to, you know, solve the the 2021 um, budget uh, issues that we've, you know, we're facing and projecting in 2021 as well. Uh, Ms. Naker. Thank you, Council President. Ms. Earl and maybe Mr. Solomon as well. The Seeing the mill and overlay program here in the street reconstruction bonding uh, line item a couple slides ago, we've been, we've been issuing $12.5 million in street bonds for as long as I've been on the council, and I think probably long before that. And if we're issuing the same amount in dollars every year for, I don't know how many years, then we're then we're actually with inflation investing less in our streets year over year. We've been hearing from lots of partners that interest rates are at an all time low right now. And a lot of, we've seen a lot of conduit revenue bonds applications because folks really wanted issue bonds right now. Would this not be the year, um, especially when we're talking about a cut to our mill and overlay program, um, to, to up that number and issue more bonds and take care of our streets that desperately need it. Why, why are we stuck on this 12.5? And do we have to be? Um, Council President Bredmon and Council Member Naker, I'll, I'll take a first shot at that. The even you're right. Even even though it's a it would be um, you know advantageous from an interest rate perspective to um, issue more bonds, there is still the cost to it. And so I think that's where the the you know the the that's where the rub is, is right. Even if we're if we're issuing more bonds, um, that means we need to update that and, and be then levying more for debt service in the future. Um, and so that's just not um, wasn't a decision that the mayor made this year relative to the the 12.5 and increasing that um, because it's not just the you know obviously the cost this year. And I, and I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know, um, but that it's it's that ongoing debt service cost and and figuring out how to balance that out and um, and keep our debt service um, keep our debt fund. Um, in a healthy position and moving towards a healthier position for our debt fund as well. So those are sort of all the factors that go into figuring out how much we want to um, how much we want to be bonding for in a particular year. But but to Ms. Nicker's point, and again, Mr. Solomon may um, touch on this now or again or when he presents next week. But the it the thing that doesn't make sense to me is if we're able to refund bonds and if we can borrow for less money, why that number couldn't go up. Um, from this this um, arbitrary 12.5, which is you know the incredibly shrinking pot of money when we know the costs increase. Um, Mr. Solomon, did you want to take that, or do you want to take it when you come in and talk about bonds? Yeah, Council President Brent Mullen, thank you. Um, I think this is certainly good context, and we can we can uh, add some uh, some beef to our presentation on on this uh, issue for next week. But um, I think uh, Ms. Earl said it exactly right that the main constraint on our debt issuance is is levy and resources needed in the debt fund to to repay these obligations. So. Um, I, I think a good example is we, we did increase and sell a little bit of uh, CIB to fund the parks on the Ford site. Um, you know, that was the one source we had to 
to uh, to get that done as part of the redevelopment agreement. And and when we did that increased bond sale, it came with an associated levy cost. And, you know, that was kind of part of the deal at the time. So, um, you know, that is the main constraint. And I think uh, we'd be happy to work with the council on on what that looks like, you know, for every dollar of uh, increased bonding, what, what the associated levy cost is. And, you know, if there's a desire to put together a multi-year plan, you know, we can we can run numbers, but but it comes back to that that levy cost and needing a source to repay any debt. Thank you, Ms. Naker. Thank you, Council President. Just including in concluding, I, I really hope we can talk more about this, Mr. Solomon, at your presentation, because it, it the point is it costs money to redo our streets, period. Right? Like we'll pay it from the levy for any bonding we do, but we've somehow committed to this 12.5. We're not trying to pay it out of cash. We do borrow to to rebuild our streets, which is what we should be doing. But this is a year, as Council President pointed out, that we that we pay the least in the future for that borrowing. So I just it I really hope we can talk more about this. Thanks. Thanks. And and a part of it, at least for me, is just be, is learning more, understanding more thoroughly. And I, it just to me, it just makes perfect sense. So, you know, if there's details and, and um, you know, other layers that are attached to it, I think it's helpful to understand as well. So I look forward to that conversation very much. OK, I am balancing our time of slides left over the time of minutes left we have in our meeting. And so I'd like to move forward. Great, and um, Council President Fredmon, I will I'll be brief on our community um, uh, projects and our CB redesign update. Um, we're in our second year now of the redesign process, and so um, the focus this year is allocating those community submitted projects. Um, and this year, the focus was on uh, SIPTEDS, uh, crime prevention through environmental design. This gives you some stats on, you know, we had 100 community submitted ideas. Um, staff held information sessions on CAB and SIPTED. Um, 76 projects were identified as potentially eligible and then um, and invited to submit full applications. The CAB reviewed and scored 40 um, based on these criteria that you have on your screen. Um, the CAB then heard presentations from applicants and then made recommendations to the mayor on September 30th. Um, I'll say this is a big lift uh, for city staff. It was um, a collaboration across um, multiple departments, um, you know, working with the mayor's office. Uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say that Madeline Mitchell really has um, put a lot of work into this process. And she's the CAB analyst and runs um, runs the CAB process in, in both years, um, but has really put a lot of work into um, making this community process work and, and supporting that um, this new redesigned CAB process. Um, so the last slide I have, oh, and I guess just one other thing. I know we've got, this says, you know, the, the recommendations were deliver, delivered on September 30th. This was all pushed back due to COVID, um, which was unfortunate and, and gave sort of one other hurdle to making this community process work. Um, but I think Madeline and then also Noel Nix in the mayor's office um, did a great job of keeping that um, community conversation going and finding a way to do that um, even during COVID and on a, on a changed timeline. Um, um, in the interest of time, Ms. I won't Ms. read Earl, this. Ms. Earl, oh, sure. I'm just sorry. I'm just going to yeah. interrupt you quick. I see Ms. Prince had a hand up. Uh, no, never mind. I I was going to ask about the projects that were recommended. Okay. okay. But just like uh, magic, she flipped the slide and everything became clear. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Uh, so Council President Brenwell and Council Member Prince, um, I, I know you all have a busy day and, and I don't want to take up uh, more time than needed. This is These are the project recommendations um, that were made and happy to you know note questions or if you all want to take a look and let us know if there's um, other items you want to discuss. But this is the last slide that I have on um, CAB. So. Great, thankful. And we do all these packets of information just for for people who are watching, um, is we as avail we have available, um, and the council members have available, and it's also attached to our uh, Legistar system, which is the online uh, I attached to the agenda. Correct. So if people can take a look at this um, more if they want to dig in. All right. Looks good. Is that the is that your last slide? Yes, Council Member Benmo, and that's the last slide I have on CAB for you all today. Great. All right, so thank you. Are there um, are there any other questions we have for Ms. Earl um, or Ms. Goodman at this time? All right. It looks like we are out of questions um, and out of time, but we once again appreciate all the work and effort it takes to come to uh, a point where you can present to the council and the fielding of questions that are coming from all over the place. Um, we just we really appreciate this. We may have questions that pop up um, in the the days to come, and we'll get those those to you as we um, 
muddle through the uh, the next six weeks of our budget process. So we really appreciate this very much today. Um, thank you for your presentation. Great, thank you, Council President Bagnon. Thank you, thank you, Council President, Council Members. Um, and so to my colleagues, we ha are um, at the end of this meeting, so uh, we will be adjourned and I'll see folks at 3.30 for our city council meeting. Thank you.